Are y'all here this morning? Are y'all ready to worship? Amen. Let's lift up our hands and let's welcome God. God, we thank you. Father, you have your perfect way in this place. God, thank you for bringing us here safely. Thank you that we're part of a big family of God that's meeting this morning all over this earth. We welcome you to have your way in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
making all things new. Your blood speaks a better.
the precious blood of Christ is rewriting my history. And it covers me with testimony. And it's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ. Thank you for your blood, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you this morning.
of all of those and I just feel that that spirit of God is doing that he knows how to come by and just high five when you're on the mountain and go yes 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 let's go let's go and he knows how to come down to the valley and sometimes he doesn't even say anything but like Elijah under that tree I feel like the spirit of God just crawled up underneath there with him and just laid there for a while and listen to Elijah's heart being poured out. And he said some pretty intense stuff. He basically was saying, God, why have you left me by myself? There's nobody else like me on this earth. And God just laid there with him. And then he said, you know what, Elijah? That's not completely true. There's a lot more like you, but you gotta get up in order to go find them. I'll take you to the ones that are like you, but you gotta get up out of the bush. <laughs> come here and I'm not even going to tell you to go on your journey without first feeding you he sent ravens he sent provision and food in the state that Elijah was in God loves you whatever you walked in here with that's why that no, the holding nothing back came out is because whether you're on the highest of highs or the lowest of lows you can lift your hands you can lift your head you can cling to a living God your name he knows your story he knows your story and your voice matters it's important that even if all you've got is a little whisper that you just say you are good 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 it's important that out of your mouth and out of your belly you say you are good God and I trust in you can you just do that with me in your way whether it's a shout this morning or a whisper, would you just declare the goodness of God? God, you are good. Psalm says, I would have lost heart had I not believed. I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I would have lost heart, but I believed. I'd see the goodness of God. You are good. And you are good. You're good.
been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head And I will sing of the goodness of God
lift up your hands one more time and let's just sing that chorus again. Make that a declaration. No matter what you're experiencing, He is still good. He is still good. Let's lift up our hands. Oh my love, you have been faithful. Of the goodness of God, and I will sing of the goodness of God. You know, probably during one of the most difficult seasons of our life, I penned this. I've experienced loss and I've experienced healing, yet neither lack the goodness of God. God is so good. And let me just encourage you, if you need some strength today, the joy of our Lord is our strength. And we try, we think of joy as like laughter and all that, and that's a byproduct of it. But joy is actually an unshakable awareness that we possess good from God. So if you need this morning some strength, lean into His goodness. Just lean into the goodness of God this morning because it is chasing you down. His goodness is chasing you down this morning. So Father, right now, I just thank you, Father. What a privilege it is for us to come before you and worship you together, Father. Lord, I look at your people that you love so much, and I thank you, Father, for each and every one of them. I thank you, Lord God, Lord, that we just get to be here and be your kids this morning, Lord God. No other agenda but just getting to be your kids all together, Father. Lord, every Sunday is like a big family reunion, Father. And I just thank you for that, Lord God. And I thank you, Father, for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness in each person's life. I pray for a revelation this week of your goodness, Father. As they look back over the years of their life, let them see where you have chased them down. Lord, and we just thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Pastor Jake Holtz. Man, you guys are awesome. I appreciate you guys so much. Well, I just want to start off real quick um, by honoring our pastors. Pastor Todd and Cindy, Pastor Callie, Pastor Bob, all the church leadership. They've been an amazing example in my life. I just want to honor them before we get started. Lord God, I pray that today um, you use me to speak the words that you have for people. You see every heart in this room, and I want to be used by you. Help me, Lord, to hear your voice, guide my tongue and speak to the people here. They're all in different spots, God. You love us so much. You're such a faithful God. I thank you that we have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive what you have for each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, man, I love you guys. I've gotten so much encouragement this week um, from so many of you guys. Um, Even though I've had moments where I was nervous and a couple days there where I was freaking out. (laughs) 
Um, there's been a lot of people that have encouraged me. Um, and, um, you know, as in those couple days that I was freaking out, I would come up with a sermon and uh, I would throw it away. And I'd come up with a sermon with three great points and I'd throw it away. And then I would see a pastor online and I would act like him for three or four hours. <laughs> and uh, then I would catch myself in the mirror and just be like, okay, that's not gonna work, you know? Um, and the whole time I was constantly encouraged by people to Jake, be yourself and uh, get up there and do what God's called you to do. Um, so I appreciate you guys so much. Um, after going through three or four different sermons uh, and chunking them all, uh, after talking to some leadership and getting some, uh, getting some encouragement, I realized that the best thing that I can do for my first time speaking to you on a Sunday morning like this is to give you my testimony. And just encourage you, hopefully, uh, encourage you with what God's done in my life. Um, we're all in different spots of our life, and um, sometimes we're good at kind of playing the game of church on Sundays. And um, my story is, is a little bit of that, and God rescuing me from me and bringing me back home. So hopefully um, my testimony will give you context for some of the things that I say up here and that I've said in the past. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm a broken record when I get up here. I'm, I'm standing up here, my job is to do announcements, but I'll pray and I'm, I'm really hoping every time I walk up that I don't just do announcements, but I do what God's called me to do. And then I'm listening uh, to the Holy Spirit. And the truth is, is some of these things that I say, um, I'm sure you've heard me say them. And um, I just want, I want to uh, give you a background that helps you understand why I'm always saying them. I know it uh, from hard fought lessons in life. I'm sure you've heard me say, God is always faithful. I'm sure you've heard me say, find someone this week to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I'm sure you've heard me say, we need to stand on the promises of God, uh, the promises of God that we see in our Bible. Hopefully by giving my testimony, I can give you some context of why I sound like a broken record some Sunday mornings. I grew up in church, um, grew up in this church, but before this church in 2002, it didn't matter if I was with my dad or I was with my mother, I was in church. Um, we would go to spirit-filled churches, so the presence of God was always very palpable in the room. And from a young age, I kind of understood that the presence of God was truly powerful and bigger than any situation I was in. There wasn't a time that I would go to a church and there'd be a prophet that I didn't get called out almost every time. Um, I remember trying to hide a lot of the times behind people, but they would always kind of zone in and tell me who God had called me to be. They would say, Jake, you're supposed to be a pastor. Um, and while, I, while it resonated in me, and I believed it as a young boy, I also fought with it a little bit. I wasn't sure how God was gonna do that. In 2002, when this church started, I moved from Pearland back to Baytown uh, to live with my mother and be a part of the church. I started out, um, you know, all of us started out in the early days of helping Pastor Todd load in every service, right? Everybody in the family, it's like pick up a speaker and get in there. We gotta, we gotta load this thing in before service. But the first instrument that I played was the rain stick. This big, 
wild looking rain stick on an amazing so song called uh, Let It Rain. Still one of my like favorite songs. Um, but I remember being handed the rain stick by Pastor Cindy and uh, I can't remember exactly what she said, but it was enough for me to be like, hey, it's a rain stick, but you know what? I'm gonna crush this rain stick on this song. Um, at that time, April was coming to the church and I, I, no joke, remember playing this rain stick, thinking to myself, which this is not great, but it is the reality of the story. I wonder if April can see how good I am with this rain stick, you know? I was like getting into it and hoping that God was using me and April was seeing me. Um, I guess I did good at the rain stick. I did a good job. They, they elevated me to uh, playing the bass on Thursday nights. Um, I didn't know it at the time. Um, I was definitely voluntold to do it. Um, and in our family, in any ministry family, you just kind of get with it, right? Um, I had no idea at that time, though, what, what you know, playing the bass uh, would do in my life. Uh, I just thought, you know, I'm just filling, filling a role here. Um, as time went on, we went from, you know, playing just Thursday nights at our local youth group. And uh, Leland, Leland was leading worship. We had Jack on the keys. We had Mike that was playing drums this morning on the drums. And me on bass. Uh, PT a lot of time would play keys. Um, but slowly but surely, we started, you know, playing at other youth groups and playing at other churches. Um, we realized that we should take it pretty serious and uh, we had great parents that definitely did not, you know, sugarcoat that we needed to be, you know, better, right? I remember at, at one point we had someone come down from, from Nashville and he was in this amazing band um, and we all looked up to him and and Pastor Cindy and Pastor Todd and mom were like, hey, we want you to give it straight to the boys, like where they're at. Because there was talk of, you know, going to a uh, Nashville and recording a record, maybe getting signed to a label and all this. And, you know, we're like 16, you know, 15, 16. And he comes in and, you know, basically said, hey, yeah, it's great, but it's also terrible. And you got to fix this, this, and this. And I was on the list, you know what I mean? Like, you got to pick it up. So I remember we just went into this mode where we were just practicing constantly and, uh, and God was using us. As we played more and more, we got better um, and God used us in a powerful way. And before we knew it, we were traveling the country doing 200 plus dates a year uh, in an overloaded uh, trailer and band van, recording our first record in Nashville. And... Uh, it was, a, it was incredible. It was really an incredible time in my life. And um, we went from that band van to a bus and from that bus to traveling all over the, um, the world at one point. The whole time though, um, you know, I knew God, I knew the presence of God, but I didn't have a strong foundation in God's word or in my prayer life. I was kind of just living off the relationship that other guys in the band had with the Lord. I was just doing enough. I was just, um, it's not that my heart was hard towards God. I love the Lord, but you know, when we weren't uh, up there serving in some worship capacity, uh, we were traveling and I, I just, you know, I was tired. So I didn't read my Bible as much as I should have. I didn't pray probably as much as I should have. And um, I never really cultivated a real foundation in God's word. Um, all the while, while we were traveling, from a small kid, I always had a dream of serving in the military. And as a, you know, we were kind of progressing, I just, I couldn't get rid of this idea of serving in the military. I remember uh, playing a show. We were leading worship. Um, there was uh, thousands of people out there. We were at a festival. I think it was probably 
close to 40 or 50,000 people out there. And I remember going through the entire show. Now, usually I was pretty darn good about worshiping and, and um, focusing on the Lord while I was playing. But um, I knew um, after that show, I had spent the entire show just thinking about what it would be like if I joined the military and served my country. And I couldn't really shake it. It was becoming an issue for me um, in my heart. And um, I remember going to my wife, uh, April, and telling her about this crazy idea of leaving the band and, and joining the military. She was like, you're nuts. Like, where did this come from? And uh, it took a while for me to kind of get her uh, keyed in on the idea of me doing it. And finally, she said, Jake, if you take your health serious, because I was not in very good shape, she's like, maybe we'll talk about it. Well, I, all that, that's all I needed to hear. Um, I started to uh, do everything I could to show her that I was very serious about this. In 2011, I ended up leaving the band and joined the military. I had grown up on too many like Rambo stories um, from my brother. I'll be quick with this story. I remember my brother, the way he would get me to uh, do things around the house was encourage me that I was John Rambo. And I loved it. I remember getting caught um, in my mother's room. I was trying to take something off her uh, uh, side you know, dresser there that my brother wanted. And she caught me. And she's spanking me. And for whatever reason, she knew that I didn't decide to do it myself, that someone had put me up to it. So she's like spanking me and saying, you know, who told you to do this? Who told you to do this? And I'm not joking. I remember harnessing John Rambo and thinking of the scene when he's being tortured. And I just was like, this is nothing to Rambo. Like, this is nothing. And I'm not joking, that's not like a made up story. I remember smiling and thinking to myself, I'm doing it, I am tough. I'm not giving my brother up, it's not gonna happen. So, you know, I, I always had this idea uh, of joining the military and uh, becoming a Green Beret. I went to basic training, went to jump school, um, and I went to a litany of courses um, that made up what they call the Special Forces Qualification Course. Uh, when you're in the qualification course, um, you can have really only one focus, or at least at that time, that's what I believed. If I was not thinking about the next course that I was going to, that each course, the, the pool of guys was dwindled down. And these were not just regular guys, these were the best the Army had, and I was straight off the streets, you know what I mean? Like. I wasn't, I didn't know that I had the ability to hang with these guys. Um, but each course that you went to, the, the pool of guys got smaller and smaller. And I was going to church less and less. Um, and I was thinking about the Lord less and less. And all I was thinking about was that goal of receiving Green Beret and going to my unit and serving. As I completed each course, and fewer and fewer men around me um, were around me, pride crept in. During this time, I started to forget who God called me to be. I think it's, uh, I didn't tell this to you guys in the back, sorry. Psalm 119, I'm going off the cuff here, uh, 11. Store God's word into your heart so you won't sin against God. Um, I had not been doing that in my walk with God prior. So as pride crept in, who I was started to break down and I started to turn into something else completely. I remember in language school, which is a six month course, you spend eight hours a day uh, learning a language that you're designated. I was told Indonesian. I had my teacher, Boo Karina, hold me back during lunch, and this was two or three months into the six-month course, hold me back from lunch, and um, she said, God told me to tell you that you're called to be a pastor, <laughs> and you're, you're doing this military thing, but this is not where you're going to end up. I remember being touched, but I also remember being kind of put off by it. I had a plan 
my plan was a good plan. I was finding that I was good at this whole military thing. Like, I, I was having success. I didn't have time for it. After completing the Q course and earning my Green Beret, we were off, me and my wife and daughter, to Okinawa. After a few short weeks in Okinawa, I was given the opportunity to try out for a special unit within Special Forces. It was a unit usually reserved for more senior Green Berets. I was a brand new guy. I went to the tryout. I passed. More pride. I went to the course that's required of you after you pass the tryout. That's not easy. Um, and passed that. More pride. I was morphing into what I thought I was supposed to become to gain acceptance from the men around me. As pride grew in my heart, my heart hardened towards God. You know, in the special forces community, there's some real hard chargers. Um, and it's kind of, you got a couple different types of green berets. And the ones that I kind of uh, gravitated towards were the cowboys, the guys that were kind of wild. I started to drink heavily outside of work, initially for acceptance, but it quickly got out of hand. Last semester, uh, Pastor Bob was leading us through James. I saw this scripture and I thought to myself, man, that would have been good if I would have hid that scripture in my heart before I had ever went to Okinawa. The scripture is James 1.22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. I didn't have a foundation in the word. I, had ne I was a Sunday, Saturday, you know, whenever the show was, Thursday Christian. I would talk to God, but I didn't spend any real disciplined time understanding his word and hiding it in my heart. So when I got in this community where it's about busting a door down and getting the bad guys, and after the job is done, drinking a bunch of beer and having a good time, I just fell into it. I thought that was who I was supposed to be. I lost what God had called me to be. In a short time, I turned into a selfish, mean husband, a functioning alcoholic. I lied when the truth would fit better, and I only cared about my job and the next opportunity with the boys. I made pretty much every mistake as a husband can make, and I covered up that disappointment with myself by just drinking more. If I wasn't deployed on a trip, I was spending most of my time at the offices getting prepared for the next trip. And if I wasn't doing that, I was somewhere with the team, with the guys. I completely, completely lost myself. I thought I was becoming who I wanted to become, but in the process, I completely lost who God called me to be. I set no foundation for who God called me to be. In Matthew 7, 24 through 27, I want to read this. Because during that time, I was completely losing myself. And looking back, it's because I had no foundation that was built so I was just blowing in the wind. And the more you blow in the wind, you don't know where the wind's coming from. You're confused. You're lost. You don't know who you are. 
Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Everyone, this is Jesus speaking, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. I was falling so hard, so quick, and dragging my family along with me. My wife didn't know what to do. I was a mess. She pleaded with me to get right, to fix myself. And for a couple years there, we did this off and on thing where I'd try to get right, and then I'd fall back into my own ways. I'd try to get back right, and I'd fall back into my old ways. There was a point where I remember, because I wasn't telling anybody at work or at home, I wasn't telling anybody what I was mentally and spiritually going through. I was a Green Beret. I was good at my job. People respected me. I had it figured out, or at least I should have it figured out. I was so lost and didn't want anyone to know. I honestly felt it insane at times. I had worked so hard to accomplish this dream, but I was utterly empty on the inside. I didn't want to turn to God because I was full of pride and believed that I could dig myself out. After years of this, April finally came to a breaking point. She had not married the man I had become. She packed her things up, and her and Violet went back home here to Baytown. For the next six months, I was touch and go between work trips. I would clean my act up again, and just for a little bit, and then I would find myself back doing the same old thing. I finally convinced her to come home with grand promises of a new me. She was back in Okinawa for maybe three weeks before she had to drag me through the front door because I was too drunk to walk on my own. I knew the next morning when I walked into the living room or kitchen that this was the last straw for her. She was broken. She couldn't do it anymore. She couldn't let me keep failing and failing and failing and hurting and hurting and hurting her. I knew that she was probably never going to return. At this point, I really accepted in my heart that I was never even going to go back home. I would go through a divorce, I would live my life in the military, going from trip to trip to trip, to trip. By this point, my whole family knew what a wreck I had become, and there was no going back in my mind. After she left that second time, the next three months were truly the lowest I've ever been. I've always been a glass half full guy. Um, Up until that point, life was pretty good, and I was happy about it, and if things got rough it was not that big of a deal we got a new day tomorrow I wasn't that guy anymore I remember standing on the on my fourth floor apartment balcony peering at the ground below and understanding why people would kill themselves I had put myself here I had lost my way I was lost and I didn't know how to find a way out. A week or so later, I was heading down the coast um, after a long day of drinking, trying to keep my truck between the lines. 
And I was done for, just done for. And I remember finally, out of desperation, telling God, yelling to God that I was sorry and asked him to please come save me. (laughs) Up until this point, I had not felt the presence of God in a very long time. My heart was hardened. In an instant, in an instant, God filled my car with his powerful love. I pulled off to the side of the road and I immediately sobered up and was blown away at how close he felt. I remember sitting there for an hour or so and at one point asking God, not in a an accusatory way, but just talking to him and saying, God, where, where have you been? I felt like he said, I've never been far, but I've only been as close as you would allow. I knew in that moment that I had put myself in that position, but with God's help, he could pull me out of it. April ended up returning. And I honestly was kind of surprised that she was deciding to return. I told her this story, but you know, she had no reason to even believe that that was a real story. I was a liar. I was a failure in so many ways. But she decided to return. And I was kind of blown away about it. And when she returned, um, we didn't have some mushy reunion. Uh, When she came home, all she did was just take care of me. We didn't talk much that first month, but she just took care of me. She showed me what the hands and feet of Jesus truly were. I had no idea, but she had had her own encounter with God back home. I remember knowing that it was hard for her to come back And I definitely knew that it was hard for her to be treating me so good. I didn't deserve it. She didn't do it because she loved me at the time. All love was really lost. There's no doubt about it. And she'll tell you yourself. She did it because God told her to. I would love to say that I immediately got it all together. But that's not the truth. It took time. I had destroyed my marriage, myself, in the process. But God was beginning to restore what I had broken, what I could not fix. So when you hear me say God is always faithful, it's because God has not only restored my marriage, He's made it better than it ever could have been. He took something that I was convinced could not be fixed. And he molded it back together in a way that's much more incredible. When you hear me say to find someone this week to be the hands and feet of Jesus... I say it because I don't think I would be standing here in front of you if it wasn't for my wife being the hands and feet of Jesus to me. When I say we need to stand on the promises of God that we see in our Bible, it's because I know that you need a strong foundation to weather the storms of life. 